July 6th edition of PFTOT. We are just 19 days away. 19 days away from the return of PFT Live to Peacock, Sirius XM85, and wherever else you take in the show with Chris Sims and me four days a week and Peter King on day five and Shereen Williams and Miles Simmons as needed when either of the two primary co-hosts aren't available. So let's get to it. It's just me again. And it's some of the top stories in the NFL right now. There isn't a lot going on if you haven't noticed. And I shape a lot of what I decide to talk about based upon questions I get. And of course, I get a bunch of questions about Deshaun Watson. What is going on? Well, nothing right now because the league and the union are putting together paperwork that's going to be submitted by next Monday, July the 11th. And both sides will presumably submit their paperwork simultaneously so the other side doesn't get a chance to react to what the other side had to say that's when the clock ticks on judge robinson to come up with a decision i still think it's going to take two weeks anything less than a week or so makes it look like she rushed it i think two weeks makes sense july 25 is when i'm really going to start paying attention with the possibility of july 22 that friday beforehand but just about the time we come back on PFT Live, Peacock, Sirius XM85, et cetera. That may be when the window opens for a decision with Deshaun Watson. There's been a lot of talk about settlement, too. I wrote about this late last night slash early this morning. And I think it does make sense. It always makes sense for two sides that are in any type of a legal proceeding to come to a decision if they can. It's better to engineer the outcome and have both sides a little bit upset then roll the dice and ensure that one side is going to be really upset and the other side is going to be really happy. It's just part of managing the outcome and coming up with something that works for everyone. In theory, that makes sense. Here's the problem. Fundamental challenge for the NFL. It cannot afford to be perceived as being lenient in any way on Deshaun Watson. And when the league is repeatedly making it known that it's seeking a minimum suspension, of one year for Deshaun Watson. How do you back off on that without appearing weak, without appearing ineffective, without appearing too lenient with someone who the league believes did enough to justify a full year suspension? Why are you giving up now? Why are you folding tents and accepting a six or an eight game suspension? That to me is difficult to accomplish until Judge Robinson issues a decision because Her decision, in a certain way, sanitizes the league's position on this because she's the one, true outsider, who comes to the conclusion as to what happened here. That's why I've said time and again, it's critical that whatever she puts on paper makes sense, is understandable, no jargon, legalese, mumbo jumbo, something that is simple that people will say, okay, I get it. I may not agree with her outcome, but I understand how she got from the entry to the maze to the exit of the maze. And by doing that, it makes it easier for the NFL to say, for example, okay, she suspends him. And I'm just throwing numbers out here, four games. She suspends him four games. Then the league, since it has the hammer on appeal and the commissioner can, in theory, the way the CBA is written, the way the personal conduct policy has been revised in 2020, He can take that four and turn it into 17 if he wants to. That's when I think a negotiated outcome becomes more practical. It becomes more likely. It becomes more feasible because that's when the league can say, look, she set the floor and we know what the ceiling is. We'll just try to reach something in between. And I still think back to that idea that kind of popped up a week or two ago of, treating 2021 like an unpaid suspension after the fact. You'd have to give up the $10 million he made in salary last year for not playing. And I understand that we're in an age where people just lock into a position and just shout it regardless of reality, regardless of whether it makes sense. And I'll hear all the time, oh, he, he, he chose not to play. He, he wasn't on paid leave. Look, let's take a step back. Let's all take a step back and ask ourselves, Without this off-field issue in 2021, 22 lawsuits at the time, 
10 criminal complaints without those entanglements. He plays last year, doesn't he? He gets traded last year. The Texans don't dig in and wait as the season unfolds. They get a deal done. Somebody would have wanted him. Somebody would have said, let's go do this. The trade would have happened. He would have been a dolphin without the, the off-field issues. Period. By the trade deadline, he would have been a dolphin. So he would have played last year. So, and, and I know that, look, like with any other issue that we deal with in these times, there are two sides with a huge gap in the middle. And it's very difficult to find middle ground. There are the people who say he shouldn't be suspended at all. He didn't do anything. There's no proof. And then there's people who say suspend him for life or at least a full season. So the NFL has to make its decisions in light of the fact that you've got these two polar extremes. And I think waiting for Judge Robinson to make her decision makes it easier for the NFL to then try to settle it. But, but remember, the NFL has got the hammer at that point. As long as she imposes any discipline on him whatsoever, the NFL has the hammer. The commissioner on appeal can enhance it to whatever he wants. He's only limited by her factual findings. He would have to take her factual findings and say, okay, I accept these. I have no choice but to accept them. But I think under these facts, the way the personal conduct policy applies to these facts, the punishment should be much more than what someone who was a federal judge for 25 years had concluded. But he still has the power to do it. And in theory, there's nothing the union can do after that under the CBA. I know they can go to court, but again, judges don't like to get involved when private parties have put together a comprehensive system for resolving their differences. So we continue to wait, we continue to watch. A settlement could happen at any time. I just think it would be a very tough sell for the league to explain to people why after insisting on a minimum suspension of one year, the league decided, okay, we'll do six games, four games, eight games, whatever. It's going to be tough to do. Even if you make 2021 a de facto after the fact suspension, it's going to be tough to do. And from Watson's perspective, somebody pointed this out to me today. Hey, there's going to be all sorts of awkward and embarrassing facts that come out if Judge Robinson issues a written decision. How is it any worse than what's already come out? Like, I don't think from Watson's perspective, part of the leverage is against him. Oh, hey, if you don't settle this, there's going to be a lot of stuff. It's going to be, they're going to say a lot of stuff. They already are saying a lot of stuff about him. How worse can it get? So I, I think that the league knows it has to wait. And the risk the league takes is that Judge Robinson will impose no discipline whatsoever. And then that slams the door on anything that the league could do on appeal. And he's back week one. Although we, we've talked about it before. I don't want to spend too much time or much more time than I already have on this. I think it's tough to get no discipline at all, but we'll see. We'll see. It's going to be a fascinating read. I assume since it doesn't involve an owner, there will be full transparency. Since it involves a player, the league will release the full document for all two. Some people have been trying to report into existence a sale the Seattle Seahawks. It prompted Jody Allen, the owner of the team. She inherited the team along with the Portland Trailblazers and the rest of her brother's estate from Paul Allen when he passed in 2018 to issue a statement yesterday saying the two teams aren't for sale. Now, this comes after weeks of speculation and reporting. Phil Knight, the Nike founder, supposedly submitted an offer to Jody Allen for the Portland Trailblazers. Plenty of talk about the Seahawks and the Trailblazers being for sale. So they're not for sale now, but if you read the statement, if you saw our article at PFT and you saw some of our tweets on this, it's pretty clear that eventually the teams are going to be for sale. And if you peel back the language and parse it out and think about it and you consider some of the reporting out there, and this all started with a suggestion from a radio host in Portland whose name escapes me at the moment, that... Paul Allen's trust calls for these properties to be sold so that the money can be devoted to some of his pet projects, some of his causes. That's going to happen eventually. Now, they're creating the impression there's no timetable for that. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier as it relates to Baker Mayfield. The Seahawks are trying to set up, in my estimation, the idea that we're not interested in selling. That drives up the price. 
the price ends up being whatever someone pays. Broncos, $4.65 billion. Do you really think that that number was driven by some, some specific calculation of revenues and net worth? And no. Something is worth whatever someone will pay for. If someone really wants it, they'll pay enough to get it. And if part of your leverage is, I'm just going to keep it, and I'm in no rush to sell, that drives the price higher results in more money that ultimately goes through Paul Allen's estate to the causes he wants to support. So it's smart. And also the other thing to remember, there was some reporting on this a couple of weeks ago. Again, I can't remember who it came from, but the idea that the deal for the Seahawks current stadium requires 10% of the proceeds of a sale of the team to go to the state of Washington. If it's done before May of 2024, this isn't going to be done before May of 2024. And I guarantee you that if they get an offer they like, at some point after May of 2024, or if the offer comes in just before that and they get the deal done after May, two years from now, they'll, they'll, they'll take it. They'll take it. But you get more that way than if you just hold an auction. When you hold an auction, you don't know who's going to show up. You don't know when they're going to put the paddles up, when they're going to put the paddles down. As we reported, Josh Harris was willing to pay $5 billion for the Broncos, but he didn't want to bid $5 billion unless he knew $5 billion would get it done. He couldn't get that assurance, so he didn't do it. So what happens? The Walmart clan saves $350 million. Josh Harris could, could offer $5 billion right now for the Seahawks. It's not for sale. How about $5.1? It's not for sale. How about $5.2? It's not for sale. How about $5.5? Not for sale. How about six? So that's how it works. So there's high stakes. It's a dance. There's a lot of nuance. But at the end of the day, it's very simple. You want part of your leverage to be, I'm just going to keep it. I'm just going to keep it. How about this much? I'm just going to keep it. How about this much? I'm just going to keep it. At some point, at some point, you say, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll sell. One last point before we get to some of the questions, and it's become a big topic this week. We hear about this from time to time, but the news that Demarius Thomas, former NFL receiver who died of a seizure back in December, had grade two CTE makes news. It makes headlines. We still don't know what it means to have CTE. We I think we're at the point where we assume anybody that's played football long enough to play at a high level in the NFL has some amount of it. It's inherent to the sport. But what does it really mean for the sport? And people have asked me, what can the NFL do about this? The NFL is doing all it can. The NFL, and look, let me be clear here. When the NFL is at fault, and I'm talking about the league office, when they do things that they shouldn't do, I will be the first to call them out. But I also think they need to be praised for certain things they do that are smart. And one thing the NFL realized, October of 2009, when the commissioner and D. Smith, the NFLPA executive director, were called before Congress, the Judiciary Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, and they were pressed on the failure to do anything about head trauma, they got their house in order. And the NFL has systematically tried to make the game safer. The NFL has tried to remove all unnecessary helmet contact from the game. Now, they haven't gone as far as to remove contact that is deemed necessary. One of the things we pointed out after John Madden died late last year, he was advocating two-point stance for offensive and defensive linemen to avoid that initial blow to the head that happens when the offensive lineman fires off the ball to block on a run play or when the defensive lineman hurdles into the offensive lineman to try to get past him on a pass play. They haven't made changes that would fundamentally alter the way the game looks and feels, but they have tried to remove or minimize unnecessary helmet contact, whether it's at games, practice, off-season workouts, et cetera. They're trying to protect the human brain as best they can. There's just only so much you can do because it's ultimately football. Yeah, that clunky rule they put in place a few years ago about lowering the helmet to initiate contact. It's a mess to enforce. It's explained in Playmakers. It wasn't even something that was created by the football people. It was a PR slash health and safety thing to create the impression they're doing enough to enhance safety, knowing that there's only so much you can do. And that's really the end of it. There's only so much the NFL can do. 
And let's be realistic about it. And I know that there's plenty of people out there that, oh, oh well, the guy's just trying to protect uh, where his bread's buttered. But look, I, I don't want football to go away. I don't want football to stop being played. Millions of people don't want football to stop being played. The reality is, and, you know, a lot of the folks who were agitating for the downfall of football 10 years or so ago, making a big deal about decreased youth participation and people aren't going to play football and everybody understands now the risks and they're just going to choose not to play. And remember when Chris Borland retired after one year in the NFL, the folks who want to bring down pro football were acting like, oh, this is the first of many. It's the first of one. Seven years later, one who retired early specifically because of concerns over head trauma. Now, every once in a while, there'll be a guy who retires in his 30s, who's at the veteran minimum salary one year at a time stage of his career, and he may throw out that idea. And it makes sense at that point, because how much more do I want to take for a veteran minimum salary when I've already made a bunch of money and I've got it saved? I really don't want to go through this for one more year, take another full season, of blows to the head periodically for that amount of money. It's just like buying the Seahawks. If you're going to give me, you know, oh, for 1 million, I won't do it. 2 million, maybe I'll do it. 3 million, I'll definitely do it. 4 million, yes, sign me up. That's just one of the factors that gets included in the decision to be made as to whether or not to keep playing. So the bottom line is the NFL is doing everything it can to make the game safer. There's only so much that can be done and players are still playing. They're still playing. And it's not just football. Soccer. There was a, a former MLS player who had grade two CTE. That just came out last week. Rugby, hockey, auto racing, MMA. My God, have you ever watched a UFC event? The UFC benefits from the fact that it's not more popular than it is. Because if it was as popular as football, it would be banned. It is far more brutal right now than football. I mean, I remember seeing some of these exchanges where, you know, a guy gets hit in the head six, seven times before the referee can spring over top of the, the fighter's body to, to stop the brain damage potential. So there's a lot of sports out there that involve contact with the head, potential for concussion, and, and people know the risks. They can't say they don't now. They know the risks and they choose to play. So I, I'm, I'm not here to try to convince anyone. I'm just explaining how it is. Yes, there are risks. Yes, people get CTE. No, we still don't know what it means to have it. And I worry about the guys who played and who can get freaked out by this possibility that they think it's inevitable that they've got something in their brain that's going to go haywire. That's a tough thing to walk around with, assuming that one of these days you're going to wake up and you're going to be different because you played football. At some point, you're going to have some serious cognitive issue because you played football, that it's inevitable that's going to happen. I don't think it's inevitable, and I still don't think we're anywhere close to fully understanding and appreciating what it means to have CTE. All right, let's see what questions we have. For this Wednesday edition of PFTOT, that's my way of buying time while I queue up I usually queue it up ahead of time. So bear with me as I look for the tweet from earlier today. Let's see what we have here. Going in sort of blind. I looked at them a little bit earlier. There's some repetition here. I mean, PFT and uh, PM Posse, did you, did you not listen to Friday's episode? You got like two or three questions already asked me and then I already answered. Ask and answered would be the objection from, uh, from lawyers in the crowd. All right, let's see what we have here. Here's one. Why are legal and political documents, which affect so many regular and everyday people in our everyday lives, written in legalese or language that most law lawyers, politicians, legal experts, et cetera, can't understand? Look, it's just, it's just, it just kind of happens that way. You know, there, there, there can be an insensitivity to the audience or, or a failure to properly gauge who the audience should be. But there is a lot of, and I think I try to impress people too. I think that's part of it. If you write it in too simple or common of phrasing, you're going to have people that you look up to or your rivals, you don't want to look stupid or ineffective to them. I, th I think there is a lot of that goes on. It's human nature. There's certain people you want to impress. 
Got to make it look good. Got to make it sound good. The problem is, yeah, 95% of the people can't even begin to understand it. But that's just kind of the way it is. And it is a different kind of language. And I think the best lawyers who are good writers know when to write in a way that the average person will understand, if the average person is the intended audience. I think that's really the key. Understanding who your intended audience is and, and drafting it for them and not getting caught up in this idea that I need to impress somebody. Or they need to look smarter or not look dumb, not use too common or basic of language. So that's just part of it in a nutshell. All right, let's see what else we have here. Sean, I, you can't be serious here, Sean Alvishar. Do you think the AFC, the NFC might reach out to Alabama and Georgia to expand the conference to 34? I mean, it's, it's funny because there's some truth at the bottom of that. These college programs are becoming professional operations and they have been they have been the fact that players were able to make no money until july 1 of last year helped just keep the fiction intact that these aren't billion dollar professional football operations once the players can get paid even if it's indirectly that ripped down the facade and we all know that that these are essentially professional sports operations and we're seeing what happens the, the the best teams the teams that are perceived to be the most successful in this age of the nil money where if you play in a bigger market with a bigger alumni base and more money that possibly comes in to help you get better players that's just going to be the key to having the best teams and they want the best teams and the best conferences and espn is part of it and fox is part of it everybody's trying to be kingmaker here as they reshape college football but i don't think we're going to see alabama or Georgia become part of the NFL anytime soon. But we're going to see college football look and feel a lot more like the NFL in one very good way. I made this point yesterday. Right now, you got a small handful of teams that are going to compete for the championship every year with, with some, some potential for turnover, right? A Georgia pops up and supplants a Clemson. Alabama is just kind of always there. Ohio State's just kind of always there. When you get it down to su two super conferences, that truly are making all the money, that truly are in the best position to recruit the best players. And this is one of the reasons why Nick Saban is so adamant about the current NIL reality. It's going to make it harder for him to get the players he wants because there's going to be more money for those players at other schools. That's it, plain and simple. That's it. That's why he whines about it all the time. You could see more teams. You could see a broader band of programs that are ultimately vying for a championship. But it eliminates the possibility of a team that isn't in that upper echelon catching lightning in a bottle one year and riding it all the way to their championship. It's just not going to happen. If you're not in one of the top two conferences, SEC or Big Ten, it's going to be very difficult to compete for a championship. So you're going to have tiers, first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier, everybody else. That's how college football is going to be. That's what it's going to become. And uh, we're, we're in the process of those, those labor pains working their way toward what will be two super conferences, a couple of second tier conferences, some third tier conferences, and then pretty much everybody else. Neil watches PFT with the preseason now less than a month away. What do you miss most about football? I read this one earlier and I was thinking about it. I, what I miss most is that feeling that you get when you're watching a game that is close in the fourth quarter that is exciting in the fourth quarter and you just can't wait to see how it all plays out. You're, you're kind of caught in this, in this middle ground of, I can't wait to see how it plays out, but I don't want it to end. I want to know who wins, but I want to enjoy it. I remember the feeling November of 2018 after that Rams chiefs game, the one that was supposed to be played in Mexico city and ended up being played at the Coliseum. You didn't want it to end. Bill's Chiefs this year in the playoffs. You didn't want it to end. You wanted to keep going. I love that feeling most specifically in the afterglow of a big game where you're waiting for the press conferences and you, you know, from the perspective of what I do, stuff you can write about, stuff you can sink your teeth into for whatever reason. Sometimes it's because there was a bad call, bad call for one team, great call for the other team. We always lose sight of that. Oh, what a bad call. 
<laughs> you think the Rams were saying that in the 2018 NFC Championship game? Gee, what about that's a shame. Oh, that's a that's a horrible call. Huh, huh. Sucks for the Saints, not for us. So I, I I really, from the perspective of what I do, I love those games that prime time that have that afterglow, that that make you want to stay up late. And that happens sometimes. Can't fall asleep. Because that, that game was so exciting, it ended in such a rewarding way, and you still want more, and you get more from the aftermath. That's what I miss the most about football season, and it will be here, as, as we always say every year before we know it. Neil watches PFT. If you held the ultimate decision on Deshaun Watson's suspension, how would you find? Well, look, I'm going to punt on this because I'm going to say I would have had to be there for the three days of the hearing. I need to know what the facts are. What evidence did the NFL present? Now, I'm told, and we've reported, that there was no evidence of actual violence, threats of violence, physical coercion. But I'd want to know the facts. I'd want to sit and hear how Deshaun Watson testified. I'd want to be able to see, and we don't know how many of the women who have accused him of wrongdoing actually showed up and testified, but you know, ultimately, there's a credibility contest here. And I'd like to think I'm pretty good at knowing when someone's full of it and when they're not, because I've been lied to by every shape and size of human being there is, every walk of life, every slice of the economic spectrum. Because what happens is, and I I feel like I've said this not that long ago, people who are new to the legal system don't realize how easy it is for people who deal with all the time to spot someone who's lying, because they're new to it. They think they're just going to go in and sell their story. And some people are very good liars. Some people are very good liars. And some people are very bad at telling the truth. They get nervous, not because they're lying, just because they're overwhelmed by the entire system. So I would want to have the benefit of hearing Deshaun Watson testify, maybe even ask him a few questions myself based upon the questions that are and aren't asked. I'd want to see the evidence against him. And I'd want to have a clear understanding of exactly what happened. And then I would take the personal conduct policy and apply it. And remember, it's not just whether or not there was any type of actual assault. There are catch-all provisions regarding undermining the integrity of the game or putting the health and safety of others, the well-being of others at risk. There are ways to get there without proving actual assault. But I would just want to have the benefit of all the evidence. And we have to trust that somebody who was accomplished enough to become a federal judge And to perform by all appearances well in that capacity for 25 years is going to know how to parse through all this and come up with a decision. And we we just have to be ready for it. And this gets back to what we talked about earlier. She needs to be able to communicate it in a way that people will understand. Her audience needs to be the average person who's going to read it or the average reporter who's going to read it, who isn't a lawyer, and try to explain it to their audience so people can buy in and understand why she decided what she decided. Man bear down, mama bear down is the newest info. The Seahawks have no interest in trading for Baker, just smoke screen. Or do you think they will start the season with Drew Locke and Geno Smith? And, and look, that's, that's part of this Mayfield issue. I'm not going to go back and recover the old ground, but the Seahawks need to be able to save some face here and not create the impression that they wanted Baker Mayfield and didn't get him because then that undermines Geno Smith and Drew Locke. You're going forward with one of those two guys. Oh, and Russell Wilson's coming to town week one. So you need your fans to feel good about whatever it is you're doing at quarterback. And it's hard to make them feel good if you go all in for Baker Mayfield and you don't get him. Then the perception is we're settling for second best. That's why if they are in it, but they're doing their damn just to make it look like they're not in it, that's why they're doing it. They don't want to create an unrealistic expectation for Baker Mayfield, and they don't want to create the impression that they really don't like the guys they have. I think that Pete Carroll likes nothing more than the idea of going forward with Russell Wilson's backup and having the team perform as well without Russell Wilson as it did with him. I think that that is attractive to Pete Carroll because he wants to prove that they were right to move on from him after a couple of years of agitation by Russell Wilson to be more involved in the offense, to be the centerpiece of the offense. And ultimately he was going to expect a market value contract, another market value contract within the next year or so from the Seahawks. 
recliner QB, hey, dude, I, I think recliner QB is the same as PFTP and Posse. You just didn't watch Friday's show. Where you been? Where you been? I think you were out of town. Go back and watch Friday's show. You're asking a bunch of questions I've already answered, but that's fine. I'd, I'd rather have repetition than none whatsoever. Picks 204, how long will it take and what has to happen procedurally for the NFL to adopt new technology like USFL, 3D player and ball tracking, et cetera, et cetera. If you truly want play-by-play -play betting, these changes need to come sooner rather than later. The key to the play-by-play -play betting is the technology that allows for no lag between what happens at the stadium and what you see on your phone or on your screen or wherever. And remember the AAF had that that technology where there was an app and the, you could see the, 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 the tracking devices that were on the various players move in real time. But I don't think that's quite the same as being able to see the action. That's the key. That's, that's the technology that ultimately matters. These other things are just bells and whistles that maybe make the calls more reliable. And at some point the NFL needs to be concerned about that, but they've been, they've been unwilling to spend the money. I, I've been a big proponent of all the money they're going to make from legalized gambling. They need to peel some of it off and devote it to ensuring that the calls are better with better officiating, full-time officiating, more creativity in improving the officiating function. That's what the NFL needs to do. Keith Horton, what will it take coming out of the Mary Jo White investigation for Dan Snyder to be removed? If White concludes Dan engaged in wrong conduct, will he be able to argue it's just one person's opinion and that he has been treated unfairly? This gets back to the whole contest of credibility. He can say, he said, she said, well, Mary Jo White's job is to determine who's saying the truth. There are ways that you can either corroborate a claim or just to get the impression the person that you're talking to is telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth or shading it in some way. And look, I'm a firm believer, and this is my opinion. Mary Jo White keeps getting hired by the NFL to do these investigations because she does what the NFL wants. That's that's one of the dirty little secrets of these outside firms that provide investigative services, independent investigation. They want to keep getting hired by a cost insensitive client to do these investigations. It's a great way to make a lot of money for your firm. So you're not going to keep getting hired if you're not giving the client what they want. Mary Jo White keeps giving the NFL what they want. So she keeps getting hired. So my prediction is She'll give the NFL what they want and they'll do with it what they will. But I continue to believe that the league doesn't want to get caught up in full-blown litigation with Daniel Snyder and doesn't want him to be motivated to air out any and all dirty laundry he may have about his partners, the league office, whoever, whatever he may know, whatever he may have in those documents that the league won't reveal. Maybe John Gruden emails really were a shot across the bow at anyone else out there who may want to mess with Daniel Snyder. See what else we have. Neil watches PFT. Do you think Baker Mayfield will play football this season? I definitely do. Absolutely do. Um, it's just a question of when the transaction happens. Worst case scenario, and I don't think the Browns can make this work. They sit on him for the entirety of the period up until the trade deadline. And then after that, they release him like they did with Odo Beckham Jr. last year. I don't think that happens. I don't think Baker Mayfield goes along with it. Baker Mayfield doesn't just need his $18.8 million this year. He needs a place where he can get properly ensconced and set himself up for his contract next year. Another one from Neil Watch's PFT. Any good movies, TV shows you've been watching recently? I have a recommendation beyond season five super fan episodes of The Office on Peacock, where you have an extended episodes. Most of them are at least a half hour long. It's great. New stuff you've never seen before. If you're a fan of The Office, you'll love it. If you're not a fan of The Office, it's a great way to introduce to the show. But, but at the risk of alienating the fine folks at Peacock, there's a show that's available on Hulu right now, God striking me dead, Com a bolt of lightning from the Comcast building reaching all the way from Manhattan here to West Virginia. The Old Man with Jeff Bridges, four episodes have been out. The, the last one was not my favorite, and I'm curious as to where it's going to go, but it's been awesome so far. Highly recommend it. Uh, Keith, Keith, the Z has busted me. No days off for PFT. Where is the July five episode? I just didn't do one yesterday because there really wasn't anything to talk about yesterday. I just, I just didn't do it. I didn't feel, and I can't say, oh, I was hung over from the night before. I wasn't, I just, it just 
wasn't happening yesterday. I don't want to sit here and just prattle on and on kind of like I am right now for no real reason. All right. I think that's it. Let's see. Do we have anything else? Uh, that's it. Appreciate you as always. PFTOT signing off for July 6, tentatively planned to be back July 7. But if there really isn't anything happening, I am not going to do it. I appreciate the fact that you want new content, but there's only so much we can talk about until we start getting some news. The good news is before you know it, training camps will be open and it will be an avalanche of NFL news and analysis. And again, 18 days from now, PFT, is it 18 or is it 19? It's 19. 19 days from now. Either way, tomorrow to be 18. PFT Live will be back. Thanks as always for your support. Check us out at profootballtalk.com. And maybe we'll see you back here again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.